all fake news. I left my children at home, so I can enjoy my <laughs> holiday. Right, well, as you can probably notice, I am not Jake. Um, I'm slightly more southern than Jake, but get well soon, mate. Um, I hope you're feeling better. But he did say, when um, Dave got me on the bill, can you do a poo joke for me? <laughs> I don't have any to hand, but this will do. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck the Tories. Uh, right, so <laughs> let good. Uh, why are you leaving? No, I'm only joking. No, I was leaving. Don't turn around. That's not funny. Right. Uh, anyway, so what we're going to do today is we're going to reinvent CSS with JS because CSS doesn't work very well. <laughs> Tense. Don't worry. Not really. Uh, today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the way that you write CSS, which I hope so anyway, and I'm going to do that by hopefully introducing you to fluid type, fluid space, some flexible layouts, and then all underpinned by progressive enhancement. And this is the key, you see, because the web is truly global, and we should build for everyone, not just for ourselves, not for our peer groups. Because the browser's actually still quite a hostile environment. You don't know whether there's going to be a bunch of extensions on someone's browser pulverizing the page that you've uh, served to them. Or, you know, they might work in a corporate environment that's blocking resources, so you never know what you're going to get. And this is why I've leaned really heavily into progressive enhancement, because I think it's the best way to guarantee that everybody gets a good experience. Not everyone's going to get the same experience, but the important thing is they're going to get good experience that works for them on their device. And the beauty of this is no one's ever going to complain about getting a good experience because they'll have no idea that they're not getting the same experience than anyone else because it'll fucking work. And this is, again, it's just the, the, the reason why we do things with progressive enhancement. So that's my reasoning, anyway. Um, what we're going to do today is actually going to build a website. It's not as nice as Sophie's website, but um, we're going to do, do that anyway. So if you're inclined, go ahead and visit this URL on the device that you've got with you. Now, I'm pretty confident that no matter what you've got, whether it's a tablet, laptop, um, phone, that's the other one, um, it will look, or it should look fine, even if it's an old phone. Now, if you're comfortable, show it to the person who's sat next to you and show them what you see on your device. And if you're really comfortable, go ahead and take a screenshot and uh, either put it in Discord or on the hashtag for the conference. But if you haven't had a chance to look at it, what it is, this is what we're building. We're building this relatively nice looking website. And as you can see, looking through Polypane, um, which is a fantastic app and sponsoring this event, um, you can see that everything just looks fine. Uh, the typography is scaling nicely. Uh, everything just seems to be rendering perfectly. So we're going to break it down. I'm going to show you how to build it. So time to do a bit of housekeeping first. Um, I thought I'd just give you a, an overview of the technology that we're using. So we're using a lot of um, modern-ish CSS today. Um, and it's all vanilla CSS. But what's happening behind the scenes is all being smushed together with post CSS. And underneath it, brace yourselves, is uh, Tailwind CSS. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Uh, and the t Tailwind CSS is doing a, a good job for us, and I'll, I'll cover more in, in later on in the talk about what it's doing. But it's, it's more like a silent partner rather than an annoying person that gets in your Twitter DMs every time you write about CSS. So um, what's also important is that there's a CSS methodology in play as well. And what that is is something that helps you to organize your CSS and helps you to make decisions about the code base as you progress through it. Um, I'm not going to go through this in too much detail because I don't got that much time. But basically, what Cube is is it's a methodology. It's, it's all orientated towards simplicity and hinting the browser rather than forcing it to do something that you want it to do. Now, I'll give you a quick run through now um, about what the, each of the principles are. But if you're interested, um, there's a documentation site. And that's got a talk that I did a few years ago, which is um, just specifically about Cube CSS and what it's all about. But it's broken down into five parts. The most important part doesn't even feature in the acronym, because it wasn't very good branding. Uh, but the most important part is global CSS. And this is really important. CSS is an incredibly powerful programming language. And it lets you to set things as high up as possible. And then using Cascade, Inheritance, and the S word that I can't say, because I'm from Yorkshire, we can write as much CSS as we can, as high up as we can, and just let the browser do its work for us. 
So once you've done all the global CSS, which is hopefully the vast majority of your CSS, then you can start to apply detail. And the first thing we do is start to look at layout, and that's the composition. And the idea of a compositional layout is that it's skeletal in nature. It doesn't matter what goes in the layout. Um, the idea of the layout is, is it just looks after itself and nothing else. And this is the stuff we covered in every layout, if you've uh, read that. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, and then there's utilities. This is where we start to do the coloring. And this is my favorite bit, because I'm a designer. So this is where you start coloring things in. And this is where the T word steps in too. Um, so what Tailwind's really good at is generating utility classes on the fly. Um, so these get generated too. But also in this uh, context of cube CSS, a utility class is something that does one job and one job really well. So that might be a wrapping container that pushes all the content in the middle, or uh, a flow and space utility that will come on to a sec. Then you get into the real coloring in aspects. Um, and the idea of a blocking cube is it's a component, so it's your button, your card, whatever. And the idea is, is because you're doing as much as you can, as high up as you can, a block is where you start to go back up and reverse and go against the grain of what we're doing. Um, because you're doing so much as high up as possible, blocks should tend to be quite lightweight, but really what they're doing is applying design detail onto the page. And then finally is exceptions. And the idea of an exception is it's the only time in this methodology where you want a real stranglehold of the browser, and that could be a state change or something like that. And instead of using a CSS class to do these exceptions, what we recommend you do is use a, a data attribute, so HTML data attribute. And the reason for that is, is because it's finite state. A data attribute can only ever be one value, so you can guarantee that it's a specific value at any given time. So that's where you get some more granular control. So that's enough of that. Let's get into the website. And what's the most important part of a website, apart from the JavaScript framework that you've chosen, is the, <laughs> the HTML. Yeah, HTML is the most important part of a website. Semantic HTML is incredibly impor important at least use semantic headings and a heading hierarchy. But why do we use semantic HTML? Well, the main reason is it gives the tool that consumes the HTML content the best head start. Now that, off, uh, of course, is the browser, but there's screen readers, there's scraping tools, there's all these different tools. Uh, the article reader in your browser, they all rely on semantic HTML to do the job for you. If CSS doesn't load, the website will still make sense. And this is because if you're using semantic HTML, a browser shipped what's called user agent styles. And these are default styles that are assigned to HTML semantic elements. So if you use semantic HTML, you get styling for free. It doesn't look great, but it does the job and the website will make sense. The other point, back to progressive enhancement, is all browsers will get a decent experience. Because if all else fails, you've got HTML. And HTML always works, TM. <laughs> Get the HTML right, you've built yourself a solid foundation. If you don't get the HTML right, you're building on sand. And we all know what happens when that <laughs> happens. <laughs> That's it for the Tory bashing. Well, maybe. Anyway, <laughs> so this is the outline of our web page. And you can see we've got a main element, and the, what follows the main element is a header that's the introduction. And then we've broken it up into sections that are articles. And you might be thinking, well, it's a good idea to use sections for that, really. It's just a big blog post that you've made look nice. Well, Uncle Bruce down here, who's looking especially dashing in that picture, um, wrote this really useful article um, quite a long time ago now. Um, and it was all about how articles are really useful for sectionality content versus sections. I strongly recommend you give that a read. It completely changed how I approach sectioning out content on a page. And we skip ahead, and we refresh our browser, and this is what we've got. Looks pretty good, right? Good old HTML. And because we're using semantic HTML, you can see links, you can see headings, you can see lists and emphasis and italics. We're getting it all for free. We've not had to write any CSS yet. That's the solid foundation that we want to start with. And then we can just build up in layers. So the first layer that we're going to start to think about is how do we start approaching writing our CSS? Now, we know we're using kubectss. We know we've got Tailwind sat underneath at the moment doing nothing we start to build foundations up. And the first part of the foundation is resetting the CSS. Now, back in the old days, um, back in the old you know, IE6 era that we've already looked at today, you used to have to really hammer browsers to level the playing field because you know, standards are quite new and browsers had lots of compatibility with each other. 
whereas now the browser landscape's actually pretty level, uh, discounting Safari. Um, and <laughs> what it means is we don't have to reset that much. But what I like to do is still apply a light level of resetting to level the playing field myself. Reminder, this is what we've got at the moment. So this is our user agent styles only page. And then it doesn't show up too well on this uh, screen actually, but that's 42 lines of CSS. And all that's in there is we're setting the box model, we're removing a bit of margin, we're setting a few typography adjustments, and that's it. And then when we move on to the browser again, it almost looks identical. The only difference is now is that the spacing's been changed because we're gonna deal with that ourselves. But really, it's pretty much the same. And that's the whole point of building up. We're mentoring the browser. We're not forcing the CSS down its throat. We're just building up in layers on top of this solid foundation. So now we've got a reset, we can start to apply cube to the mix. And what's the most important part of cube? Global CSS. So the idea of the global CSS is you do as much as you can, as hype as you can. So the first thing we're gonna do is set some variables. Now these have already been covered today uh, expertly in, in the other talk, so I don't need to talk too much about them. But you can see here, they're like constants rather than variables. These, these are actually generated by Tailwind um, via some design tokens. And that spat out this root block of properties that we can access because it's high up, it's right at the top. They're defined and everything's all good. Following them, I can start to use those variables to handwrite some for myself as well. So I like consistent spacing on the page, so I'll set a nice little gutter variable for myself, set some border radius, some little transitions, and then tracking, which is the spacing between your letters. So with them in play, building up on the foundations, we can actually start to write some CSS that will affect the page. So what's the most important element on the page is the body, because everything that's visible on the page is in the body element. And all of these properties here, apart from one, are inheritable by other elements. So when we write these properties, every element that falls under the body will pick these properties up by default. When we refresh our browser, you can see just that tiny block of CSS has had a massive impact on the page, like the overall typography is raised up. You can see the background color in there, the typography color, all done by that one tiny block. And then what I like to do once I've done this uh, global styles on the body is start to think about typography. Before I do that, I'm gonna take you on a little side quest because I want to talk to you about my current obsession on the web, which is fluid typography in fluid space. Now we're gonna use this as a demo. Imagine a designer like me hands you this. No, no real thought about how it'll get implemented. We just go, yeah, that looks, that looks good. So you, you start to think, oh, how am I gonna build this? Because that typography is ridiculous. You know, I've got massive headings and I've got this like tiny body. So I'm clearly gonna use media queries to style that typography, right? And that's fine, but you need to think about this first. So this is the, from an open signal report in 2015, and it's all about Android device fragmentation in sizes. Now remember two things about this. One, 2015, seven years ago. And two, it's Android devices only. So that discounts like Macs and PCs and all the other weird and wonderful browser sizes you get. You can even have a browser in your car now. So it's really difficult to guarantee what size viewport someone's gonna be using at any given point. So building with sort of two or three, four breakpoints seems a bit silly, doesn't it? And it is a bit silly because what you get is this. You get like this weird middle ground where sometimes the typography is bloody massive or it's too small. And I know I've exaggerated it in this demo, but you can see it's just suboptimal almost all of the time. And the CSS that's written that typography is not too shabby, you know, we're using relative units, tick. We're building up from the smallest up to the biggest, which is another tick. So that's all good. And then you think, well, that's fine, just add more media queries. All right, let's add some more. But in order to achieve typography across all of those screen sizes, I'd have to scroll for 10 years down uh, media queries to just keep making these minor adjustments to typography. There's an easier way to do that. And that's using fluid typography instead. And that's based on the viewport size that the user has at any given time. And the CSS that does it is quite simple. So a um, relatively new feature of CSS is called clamp. As you can see, you pass in three parameters into clamp. So there's the minimum size, the ideal size, and the maximum size. So the minimum and the maximum, you can think of them like locks. They're, you can guarantee that it'll never get smaller than two rem, it'll never get larger than 10 rem. 
And then in the middle, what you're doing is you're giving the browser a hint, so you're mentoring it, and you're saying, look, aim for about five view widths, um, but what's really important is you need to add that rem unit via calc so the user can still zoom the text. I don't know how it works, um, that. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's magic. But the browser does something weird that allows you to do that. If I didn't have that calculation in there, when you zoomed, the viewport would obviously shrink, so then the text would never zoom. You just, calc you just pass a relative unit in there, and job's done. Everyone's a winner, and then you get this. So we can build on this as well. Like the fluid type's great, but what's even better is type scale. Um, we've been using type scales in design forever and ever and ever. And what they do is they create natural flow and rhythm on the page um, based on ratios. So this is what a type scale looks like. And as you can see, um, as you go up, there's a lovely linear curve between sizes. And that's because every size up is multiplied by the ratio which is, in this sense, 1.250, which is called a major third. And this is how it works. So you can see you start with one rem, you multiply that by 1.25, you get 1.25, etc., 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 and it exponentially rises, and you get yourself a nice little type scale. But one type scale is probably not gonna work, because remember, we've got millions and squillions of these viewports, um, it's probably better when you've got no space to use a smaller type scale with a smaller curve and when you've got lots of space to use a much larger curve instead. Now luckily we've got a tool that will help us do that. This is a tool called Utopia which is made by the devilishly clever pe people at ClearLeft. And what it does is you pass in a smaller viewport um, and you give it a base font size and a type scale and then you put in a larger viewport with a different base font size and a different type scale. Some magic happens, and it spits out some CSS. Now, if you're interested, this is the configuration for our website. So you can see I'm using a base font size of 16 pixels, which if you were to not change anything on the user's font preferences, that's roughly what one rem would equal to. And then we set a larger viewport, uh, 1350 is not a number I just pulled out of my ass. It's actually the, the maximum width of the wrapping container that I was talking about. And in there, I'm, I've lifted the font size up because we've got more space, we want more legible text. Um, no one likes small text on a web page. If someone could let Darren Fireball know that, that would be great. <laughs> and then the type scale is 1.14. So as you see, it's a much more aggressive type scale, uh, whereas the minor third ones are much more conservative, not that conservative, <laughs> and it's all good. And what I spit out is this, which is, you know, it's ugly, isn't it? Um, it, it doesn't read very well, it's some, some all these like random values, but it doesn't matter because we set it and forget it. We put it at the top in our um, constants, um, and then we've, we've got our responsive type scale. And when you have a look at it in Utopia's handy little demo, you can see that the, especially when you look at step eight on there, it's absolutely massive when you go um, increase the viewport width, but then it goes nice and small when you get to the bottom. And that's the beauty of having these two type scales in place. Just sticking on Utopia, you can do space with it too, so fluid type, fluid space. It's near enough the same deal. The only difference is instead of having um, a scale, you use your own custom multipliers instead. And the reason for that is you just want a bit more control with space than you do with type. Um, well, what's really useful in, in Utopia is these space in pairs. So on a smaller viewport, it will pick the smallest size, and on a large viewport, it will pick the largest size from the step up. So it means you can do stuff like these chunks of content on the site. So they've got a lot of space on larger viewports, and then as you go down the viewports, that space condenses and condenses. And that's done with no media queries or anything. We just use one of these space in pairs. Job done, everyone's a winner. Keeping it simple as we go. So let's get back to our project. So this is a reminder where we left off. We set our body and our inheritable properties. So now we've done our type scale um, and our fluid type rules, we might as well get on with the typography. So the first thing we're doing, we're using semantic HTML. So we know we can work down through the heading hierarchy because we're using the hierarchy on the page. So right at the top, I'm only dealing with the top three levels of heading. I tend to try and keep it up there as much as possible. Um, and the first thing I'm doing is setting the line height to one which um, is ratio-based, so it's one of the font size or the, the rendered font size at any given time. Now, the only reason I can do that is because I'm using Inter as the font family. 
and that hasn't got very large ascenders and descenders, the uppy bits and the downy bits. So it means a tighter line height means you're not going to get any overlap between the two, which is ideal. You need to, the line height is one of those things that you need to use your eyes to just test that everything's um, working well. And then I've also reduced the letter spacing too because um, larger text, reduce the letter spacing, looks better. And then because I'm using semantic HTML, I can work down the type scale to set the typography on the page. So I set a larger size for the H1 and then just work down um, through the heading hierarchy. The other thing, this is a little design tip for you. Uh, large, long, uh, long lines of text look shit. Uh, they also read like shit because if you've got a cognitive issue or just like me, you've got just the ability to pay attention for more than 10 seconds is impossible. When, you, when you're reading across a line, a long line of text, and then you move down to the next line, there's a shift to get to the start of the other line. Now, you'll notice when you read a book, the uh, line lengths are quite short. And that's because it makes reading easier. And we're doing exactly that on this page too. So because we're using massive typography, we can actually set the max width of flow content, so paragraphs, lists, block quotes, to be quite narrow. Um, you'll notice we're using a CH. I wonder if this will work, actually. Uh, no. Not today. Sorry, everyone. Um, so a CH unit is the width of a zero character that rendered. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, I wish I had a, an old school one like that still. Yeah, and so that's the width of a zero character, the rendered font and the size. Um, so it's really useful for setting type like this. And then for the headings, I've actually reduced the max width as well because larger text, shorter lines. What you want to be aiming for if you want to do this at home is if you're using like a pretty standard body size, look for about 65 to 70 characters and you'll have yourself a nice line length. There's not much more global CSS on this page. I know I've said, yeah, do all your CSS global, but, um, and then I don't do it myself. But that's because it's a really simple design. So there's not really much more to do. So all I'm doing here is just setting some block quotes, icon sizes, styling my links, and everyone's a winner. Keep your underlines on your links as well. Um, and, <laughs> and this is what we get. And you can see that's had a massive impact on the page. Remember what we had before? It, was, it looked all right. And then now we've got the responsive um, typography in place, and we've got the line lengths. It's all starting to read quite well. Block quotes could probably be shorter, but um, this is the last time I'm doing this talk, I hope. Uh, so I can't be bothered changing it now. But yeah, as you can see, everything just reads nicely. So we can start colouring it in because we've built our foundations. We've got semantic HTML, we've got a reset, some global CSS. We can keep building up on top of it. So utilities, we've already talked about Tailwind. That's just doing the blunt force utilities, setting background colours, text colours or whatever. The utilities I want to look at are the ones that are actually useful, um, ones that do one job and do one job well. And the first one is my favorite three lines of CSS. This, I should have retired after writing this line, this uh, snippet of CSS, because I don't think I'll ever be able to do anything better. But what this does is it adds space only to sibling elements in flow context, so par uh, articles, etc., or just the page in general. And what it does is it uses a lobotomized owl selector, uh, coined by my good friend Hayden Pickering, um, and that's how you select the siblings. Now, the important thing in that select is the arrow combinator because that means instead of recursively selecting siblings, it'll only select the one level from where you're applying that utility. And the most important part of this rule is the way we're using custom properties. So we're looking for a custom property called flow space. Now, the eagle-eyed amongst you will know we've not defined that anywhere yet. So then what we do is we provide a fallback for it and in this instance, because it's flow, we're going to use an M unit, so 1M as the fallback. So that means if I apply this utility, it will work completely off the rendered font size of the element that's getting margin on it. And you get this. So you can see we've got ourselves a little article here. And the paragraphs have got reasonably um, tight space on them. But then when you get down to the subheading, because that's a larger font size and it's M based, it's got more margin on top of it. And the beauty of this is you get natural flow and rhythm because we're using a type scale, everything's perfectly in a ratio. So just by using that 1M, it's going to look great. You can also add a specific value there as well. So imagine I've got a block called my context, and in there I've defined flow space as 10 rem. When we look at how that works, you see that it no longer cares about how big the typography is. It will just give that consistent space in each time. So that means you can use the utility to uh, space sections of content out and also flow content with it too. 
Now, the other region is that one we were, uh, the other region, the other utility is that one we were looking at earlier. So you've got these regions of content. So some are blue, some are orange, some are white. Using the space scale that we uh, looked at earlier, that region does one job and one job. Well, it adds top and bottom padding. If you're cool and fancy, you could use a logical property to do that, but I am neither cool nor fancy. So I'm using padding top and padding bottom. And again, I'm looking for a property called region space. And if I can't find that, then I'm defaulting back to the space scale. So it means I can add it verbatim, or I can add more finite control in a block or with the utility class. So this is the region doing its job. We've already seen that, so we can skip ahead. And this is what our page looks like now. Now it's starting to look a bit crap at this point because we're in this sort of mid state where we're applying a little bit of detail, but we haven't got much detail in place. You see we've got these big spaces and that's the region doing its job, but you can see the flow utility doing its work as well. You've got that natural space between paragraphs and stuff. Everyone's a winner. So now let's start talking about layout. Um, there's only one layout on this page and that's this. It's a grid layout. And this grid layout does this two column grid at the top for these cards, but it also does this grid here, um, which is a little tools of the trade that are getting used to do build this website. Now you're probably thinking it's media query o'clock surely at this point, but it's not. We're gonna use the browser's um, capabilities and we're gonna give it hints of how we want to work it. So we'll set the foundations first, of course. So we're gonna use grid for this and that'll become clear soon. Uh, you could use flex, it doesn't matter. Life is literally too short to care. Um, and inside of the grid column definition, what I'm saying is use the repeat function, so that'll repeat for as many times as you define, or if you use a grid placement, uh, which I'm using there, it'll just keep going. And again, we're using the same model, so we're looking for a custom property for placement, and if that custom property can't be found, we're gonna use autofill as the fallback. And what autofill does is it'll create columns for the remaining space, as many as it can before it looks ridiculous. And then min-max is get passed into it uh, after that. It's a bit like clamp without the middle bit. And again, we're looking for a, a minimum item size for the grids, uh, grid columns. And if that can't be found, we're looking at 16 rem, uh, which is a reasonably good size. And then the maximum size is just a portion of remaining space. We use a fractal unit for that, so one FR. And we apply that to our card, and it looks crap. Um, and you think, well, okay, we're gonna have to start really like knuckling down with some hardcore CSS at this point, but we're not. We're gonna use Safari uh, uh, shortcomings to our benefit at this point. So what Safari does, um, certain versions of Safari um, and VoiceOver is if you add a class to a list, it removes the list semantics. Apparently this is not a bug, um, it's a feature. Um, I disagree, uh, but what is really useful about this is that we, you've got to take opportunities from these ridiculously stupid things. And by adding a role of list to the list, you get the list semantics back. So we can use that as a hook too. You can make a presumption and say, okay, if someone's adding role of list to a list, there's a good chance that they've added a class to it and therefore it might not actually look like a traditional list. So in our reset already, um, we've already removed list styles from those. But in our global CSS, we'll go back up and we'll take the padding off those list items too. And then we get this, still looks rubbish, but it's getting there, it's getting better. So we can start building up on that, and we can start improving it. This is the point you're thinking, is getting the media queries out? No, it's not. What we're gonna do is we're gonna use a cube CSS exception, and you can see the HTML select for them. I'm using my finger now um, instead of my pointer. <laughs> um, and what we're saying there is data layout is 50-50, and that's creating like a two column uh, grid. Thank you, Dave. Um, and then this is the important part. So remember, we're looking for all these custom properties and providing fallbacks. In this exception, we're not writing any CSS. All we're doing is defining the custom properties. So the first one we're doing is using auto fit. And that works a lot like auto fill, but instead of trying to create more columns, it'll allow columns to stretch into space. And then the second one, we're gonna use our new best friend clamp. And inside of there, we're gonna nick the minimum value, because it's quite a good value, 16 rem. But the most important part is the middle part. What we're saying is go for 50 viewport widths, 50% 50 of the screen. Now you might be thinking, well, they're never gonna be 50% of the screen because you're in a wrapping container, so that's never gonna work. And this is where you're mentoring the browser. You're telling it what you're looking for. You're not saying do exactly this. You're saying, look, mate, 
to try and do 50%. Uh, you do the maths and you work it out for yourself. But the important thing is that's what I'm looking for. And just by setting that, we've got this lovely responsive grid that if it can get there, it'll do the two columns for us. And if it can't get there, it'll stack it nicely, which is great. So we're getting there, don't worry, not too long now. Um, the, we're gonna start doing a bit more coloring in now. Um, and the, the best part of the site is these little, uh, little curvy boys on there as well. And Alistair's done a really good job of explaining how to do this. I'm gonna do a worse job. Um, <laughs> I'm using an SVG, just like, like Alistair did, but the difference is I'm just using one that I made in Illustrator and then forgot about it. And this is the SVG in, in question. Now, there's two things to look at here. First, I've added a class of curve to it, that's our block. And then the most important um, attribute is to remove aspect ratio preservation because what we're gonna do in our block is set a fixed height on it and then let the browser do the rest with the width. By removing the aspect ratio, it allows the SVG to become squidgy, and that's fine because it doesn't matter what the curve is, I just want a curve, I don't care what it looks like, I just want the curve on there. And then again, I'm using the same model of custom properties, so I'm looking for a spot color, and if I can't find a spot color, I'm uh, falling back to the light color in my design tokens, and that's why I've got all those massive spaces currently, because you've got all of these SVGs that are blending in with the background at the moment. The rest of uh, the block that deals with these curves is that section, so those regions of content have had a block added to them too. Um, we take the first curve and we flip it on its ass for when it's the first child, so then it's a toppy boy, and then for the, the bottom bit, we just leave it because that's the default. We're looking for the spot color again to set the background, so if you set a spot color on one of these sections, it'll color the curve and the background of the section in, and then we set some uh, little rules for the block color, so like headings, and you get this. So if I was to say spot color magenta, it'd color the curves and the background in, everyone's a winner. And those spot color utilities are generated by Tailwind. I don't know, pretty, pretty cool, right? Um, so you can create these custom utilities because what they provide out of the box is pretty limited. It's one of my um, problems with um, Tailwind is you only get to use what the Tailwind overlords allow you to use but luckily you can actually create your own utility classes. So I'm going through my design tokens and I'm creating these utilities that define those custom properties for us. So you can see flow spaces up there and then spot colors being generated too. And that's how we get that. It also means because Tailwind is generating the custom properties for us, we can, we can pull from those values and then that's how we get that lovely stuff. Do another block while we're here. So remember this grid, looks pretty good, right? I'm gonna show you some magic now. So the, the actual cards themselves are pretty basic, right? Just background color, everything else is just pretty straightforward. So we set that, we do that base level coloring in. But the, the main thing to think about is the second, th well, the bottom line of CSS, max width on set. Thank you, Dev. Um, and the reason for that is in our global CSS, Remember when we were setting the max width of elements for flow content? We we're making an assumption, a pretty good assumption, that a card's gonna be a list element. So to go against the global CSS, we're setting the max width to be unset, which will remove the value that's being set by the cascade. Um, and that's how, and then we can let any layout that's got the cards deal with it instead. And that's the beauty of a compositional layout. Um, don't know why I've got that there. Uh, and this is what we've got. Now it doesn't look great. It looks all right, but you see you've got this big old space at the bottom here. And that's because, you know, the progressive enhancement widely has got the most content written about it on the page. So it's, it's, it's pushing the flexible layouts block down. Now to do that, we'll create another um, exception for our grid layout. Um, and we're gonna create a, a, an exception that deals with rows for us as well. And we're gonna use a masonry layout because CSS is cool. We've got masonry for free now. We don't have to throw half a ton of JavaScript at it. The problem is though, is it's not very well supported. Um, the only way you can use this at the moment still, I think, is by setting a flag in Firefox and that's it. So the uh, support window is quite narrow, as you can imagine. But all we have to do in our CSS is do exactly that. So we say grid, grid template rows is masonry. You can see our little exception is there hanging out. But what I'm doing is I'm gonna enhance the minimum viable experience, like the progressive enhancement aspect of it as well. So I'm gonna set the alignment of the grid to start as well. 
And what that means is where you don't have support for masonry, you get this. And I'm willing to put a bet on with every single person in this room. You didn't realize that has to be a masonry grid when you looked at the page. And that's the beauty of progressive enhancement because the experience you get served works perfectly for you. If you're the one person in the world who has that um, flag set in Firefox at the moment, you get this instead. So it's building up and letting the browser do what it's uh, good at. One day Chrome might ship masonry, um, we never know. And when they do, um, the other 99.99% of people will see this. And everyone's a winner. So you just, you're just writing it for the future and you're also providing a good baseline experience for everyone else. Let's do the last bit of CSS website building now. Let's, um, let's style this little block up and then we can all go. So what I've got here is the little tools which I've stupidly called features. Um, naming things is hard. And this is how I actually like to write CSS. So this is when I, when I rarely get to do production work now um, instead of spreadsheets, this is what I do. So I'll create a block and what the block is is a configuration object for everything else on the page. So we've got utilities, we've got compositions, we've got global CSS and we're using that model for custom properties everywhere where we're providing fallbacks. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set all the custom property values. So again, I'm going to set my grid placement to auto fit. I'm going to go for 33% as the ideal size of my columns and then let the browser work out the best. I'm going to make my gutter larger and I'm going to tighten up the flow space. And the only actual CSS I'm writing for that block is center line text and that's it. For the children in that block, I'm writing a little bit more CSS. I'm making the icons look a bit better and I'm doing the opposite of what I told you to do and I'm removing the link styles off the links. But that's because it looks like this. So it's one tiny little block of CSS, job done. Park it away and we've got this whole website. And it's all being built like that. Now I haven't covered like every line of CSS because you'd have all probably fallen asleep by now. It's after lunch at the end of the day. But what I did do is I put all of the source code on Glitch, uh, which is posh code pen. And what, <laughs> what that is, <laughs> it's the best way to describe it, posh code pen, yeah. Um, and you can see all of the source code. So it's built with 11T, of course. Um, and you can see all the design tokens. You can see the bits of JavaScript that turn those into Tailwind and then what Tailwind does. So you can see how it all comes together to create this nice lightweight CSS. But let me wrap up with this. We've never had it better with browsers. So I came into this industry back in 2009. Um, responsive web design was just peeking around the corner. Um, and we, as Bruce covered earlier, we had to support IE6 back then. There's this horrible period of time where we had to build responsive websites that also supported IE6, um, which was just unbelievable. And I actually think that's where a lot of the over-engineered solutions actually came from, was that disgraceful era of web design. And to be honest, it's quite understandable. But the difference is now, the browser landscape is completely different. There's a hell of a lot of support. We've actually got compatibility. Um, well, the browsers work together uh, mainly, which is great. So these tools are probably redundant now, right? And these approaches. I think a better way to look at them is repurposed. So we've talked about it today. We've used Tailwind quite um, extensively in this site, but not in the way that is normally used. So instead of stuffing HTML class attributes with lots of unreadable classes, what we're doing is we're letting Tailwind do what it does best and generate utility classes on the fly for us. It only generates what it can see. So it's really useful for that instead. So it's just repurposing these tools that have come in reaction and making them useful for us. Now you're also probably thinking, well, that website's all right, Andy. It looks pretty good, but it's pretty basic. And surely, yeah, your little approach is gonna work for that. But I also wanna show how it works in the real world as well. Because the question I always get is, does it scale? <laughs> for, your, um, for your blog that you've written in React. Um, so <laughs> yeah, it worked great for that, pal. Um, so this is a, a project I got commissioned for last year. Um, it's the web.dev site. So we rebuilt the CSS, uh, the front end, give it a little design refresh. All of this is built in exactly how I've described it today. So we're using fluid type, fluid space, cube CSS. We're using the same model for custom properties, for fallbacks, and that powers the dark, dark theme, the light theme toggle as well. So it all it's just built on top of solid foundations each way. And this site's fucking massive as well. And it all just comes together nicely. But it's a very boring website, I agree. 
So this is one that we've just done in the, in the studio recently. Um, again, as you can see, got that massive type scale. So the, it's a really boring context, but quite a nice design. Um, and the, the, the way that the type scales work on this is that we just sit and forget it. And the typography is nice and responsive and fluid, and it looks pretty good. And then you might be thinking, well, that's another boring website, Andy. It is, but this one isn't. Now, there is a content one in here because there's a lot of flashing and glitching. This is another one we are commissioned to do using exactly the same methodology that we've been doing today. You've got this nice type scale. You've got all of these progressively enhanced flares and tweaks. Uh, there's a marquee in there as well, Sophie. Um, <laughs> and it all just builds up on solid foundations. Where there's no support for these things, this site just renders nicely. And where there is support, it progressively enhances as well. Uh, where there's reduced motion media queries, none of the glitching happens. It's all about building the web for everyone. So I'll leave you with this. Remember, always be the browser's mentor, not its micromanager. Don't force it to do things, just encourage it to do things instead. And always challenge over complex and over engineered solutions. And that might be ones that you've come up with or someone else has come up with. Always challenge it. There's always a simpler and better way to build things. And with that, thank you very much.